Hello, everyone, and welcome to Director Watch, an awards watch podcast that attempts to get inside the mind of cinema's greatest auteurs, explore what drives them, and maybe we go on a few unrelated tangents along the way. I'm Ryan McQuaid, the executive editor here at Awards Watch. Joining me, as always, is my co-host and friend, Jay Lipetter. And today, the power of Director Watch compels you oh. to listen to this episode oh, okay. on The Exorcist. I did not we're think that it. that's where you were going to start this off. Is this the big one of the Friedkin series? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I was going to say Bug. Uh, yeah, it's but either the, this or bug, bug or The Hunted. Yeah. I think the... Uh, that's no, the this big is, three. This is the, <laughs> this is the biggest one. Yeah. It's weird to be only, what, three episodes in and this be the big one? Yeah, this is number four of 11. So we've yeah. got plenty of time left. But um, we're, we're peaking early. We're peaking early. No, I, I, I have we peaked this early before? Oh, good question. In the no, series? I don't I don't I don't think so. No. Is, would no? Like is Boogie Nights peaking? No. No. I don't think so. No. Is uh what do we do? Is prisoner speaking? Well, maybe for some people it is, I guess. With, yeah, those for, I maybe know, for yeah. a fool. Morvin Collar? Was that in the second episode? Was that peaking peaking for Lynn Ramsey? That I mean, um, honestly, Ratcatcher is my favorite Lynn Ramsey. Lynn Ramsey so I did okay. I maybe we did do peak. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. but for most people, culturally, I would say we need to talk uh, about. We need Kevin. to talk about Kevin. Yeah, a movie you and I don't like. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, Todd Haynes Todd early Haynes is safe. Is Carol safe? No, Carol. Well, Carol's that's later though. I know what I'm saying. That's the peak. Is Carol? Are you saying peak? Oh, for you? I'm saying culturally. Culturally, well, far from heaven. No. Or you think Carol? I think Carol is Todd Haynes's cultural. Jesse, peak. what do you think? I'm, Carol? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, I didn't know if this is the kind of yeah you can do that pod where you know yeah. I need to be all formal or you know what Jesse? If you could just hold off for one second, jump no, jump in. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Do, no, should we do go, whatever should you I want. Go film by Listen. film through Todd Todd Haynes' <laughs> filmography. Uh, I, well, what what are we considering? What are we considering peak? If we're talking like artistic peak, like I don't know what, what like I I feel like the objective answer to give is carol because that's both a great movie and that feels like his most sort of culturally impactful movie though my personal favorite is is safe so that's my i i'm the same way safe is yeah. my favorite but carol feels like it it, it kind of is like this jesse if that person god forbid dies yes what's the exactly. movie todd haynes director of blank dies at mm. 135 What's okay. the movie? I, it's 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 definitely Carol first, and then I'm trying to think of like what the. I other think Far two From Heaven be. would be there. Far, I think, far yeah. From Heaven, and then that's it. I mean, I, I I it's kind of a little too early to say with um May December May December maybe the Bob Dylan movie like would that maybe be in the? In I'm the not third there. One? Yeah, let's well, see how the James Gray movie is. James Gray might totally body that one. I'm sure. I'm sure it's gonna fucking not. How about that? Um, Wait, James Gray is doing that one? No, James no, Mangold. James, Gray. James oh. Mangold. Sorry, James Mangold. You, you got me so. I know excited. That James I, Gray I, sounds you. good. It was James Mangold. My bad. Damn, if James Drew, Gray did a Indiana Bob Jones, Jones movie, in the Dial of Destiny. Oh, that would that that might break me if he ever did a Bob Dylan movie, like an early Bob Dylan New York Greenwich Village movie. Oh, well, it's coming next year with Timothy Chalamet from Mangold. Can't wait to James Gray. Wrong James. Sorry. Oh, that would oh man. That would that be really good. that would be really good. Fuck Sounds you. Good. Damn it. That would be really good. Um as you can tell, we're not alone here today to talk about the Exorcist. We're here with our fellow film critic and friend of the show, Jesse Nussman. How are you doing, Jesse? Hello. I'm I'm good. I'm sitting here. This is the first time I've potted in a while oh. i took a brief like kind of hiatus from podcasting wow and uh it's it's good just to be back on the back on the treadmill again back well, back on the bike bringing him out of good. retirement yeah. it feels weird because you're not actually on a treadmill right now you're just sitting down but i get the metaphor i get yeah, what you're yeah, going I'm just, for i'm sit. i'm sitting in the pod chair Have, has it been yeah. used in a while got, got a new did you dog. have to oil yeah, it up or hasn't heard me pod before Wow. Have you uh did you have to oil it up like you know cuz it was like kind of squeaky WD-40. I gave it I gave it kind of like a nice little a nice little sheen just a nice little okay. dog That's is on great pot. behavior for first pot. I got to we'll, yeah. uh, we'll see if that yeah. Somebody knocks at that Good door, side. all bets are off. 
you know probably. uh yeah definitely definitely <laughs> <laughs> yes i think we are definitely here gentlemen to talk about the biggest film in william freakin's filmography which is the exorcist a movie that will we'll go down many avenues to talk about uh because it's also not only the the biggest film it's also probably the most controversial film in his filmography um i mean maybe the production of i don't know Horse have you guys Horse. gotten the cruising yet <laughs> that's true that's true, coming but, up soon but. but in terms of the zeitgeist overall but it's almost like that movie like, wasn't big enough to be as controversial as the exorcist was yeah that, that is that is fair it, it is it is more sort of like that movie feels like there's still an aspect of film culture that is like you know i don't I don't want to publicly write or t- you know talk about that. Like that seems like a you know a hot. A hot no, that's yeah, fair. You get to do it in <laughs> two yes. weeks. Two I weeks. I look forward to listening to that that episode. But no, yeah, I guess I guess my hesitation with Exorcist is like it feels like we've gone beyond the controversy true. of it to it's some true. of like Holy it's pretty canonized. mainstream and like kids yeah. see it now. I, true, but I, I there are still always going to be dum dums out there that that tried to make this thing into a controversy and it and it, it's that it's it of its legacy yeah because it was really one of the first of its time to really talk about any of this and there were the protests and all that different stuff it's anytime you talk about religion in movies oh people they act so so um well behaved oh um, yeah. yeah the twitter discourse on the exorcist would have been rad fucking yeah. ridiculous sorry we missed, yeah. missed out God on that. damn it we really did miss out well i mean we could have had it with the remake we could have had it with the the bat. What was or the, the one? sequel? Is that or, the one that was this past fall? Whatever. Yeah, the Exorcist Believer. Believer. Yeah, I mean, just a big fan of the Believer. Uh, no, one of the worst movies I saw last year. Yeah. Got wow. un, it did also inspire me to watch all of the Exorcist sequels last oh, we'll fall. Ta- oh, we'll mm. talk about that. We'll talk yeah. about that. I haven't seen any of them except Believer. Yeah. Uh, good. Yeah. Well, oh wait, no, no, no never mind. not good. No, I've only not good. seen not good. that's the only one I've seen. Yeah, not good. Okay. Um, but before we even get into that uh, and get into the Exorcist, which I mean, I don't need to explain or set up what the Exorcist is. If you're listening to the show, you know exactly what you're getting yourself in for. Jesse, I got to ask you about William Freakin as a director, mm-hmm. and uh, clearly, obviously, big fan of the Exorcist. But as uh, for the director on the whole, uh, what do you think of Freakin? Uh, what about him makes him stand uh, next to or maybe even beyond his contemporaries uh, and makes him you know, a director that you really like? Um, I mean, it's weird because he's not one of those kind of like Mount Rushmore directors for me that like, you know, I even even his best, you know, he's not one of those pantheon directors for me where like it's I feel the spiritual connection to their work. Um, But he is someone who I think like, And part of that, I think, is because he peaked so early in his career. Like, if you look at kind of his best, most iconic movies, like, they're all pretty much in the 70s with maybe, like, a couple in the 80s. And so he also just wasn't someone that was, like, continuously making movies. I mean, he was throughout my my lifetime, but, you know, those movies weren't necessarily getting the same kind of mainstream attention as you know it it was very clear he had moved beyond his his peak and that's what sort of i think made him less interesting to me but coming to his work later over the years you get this real sense of like this is a guy that could really give a like tactile realism to everything you're watching on screen whether it was like a super gritty cop drama or you know you're out in the jungles and sorcerer and you know you feel like you're actually out there in the the amazon rainforest or a movie like the exorcist that i think like one of the things that's great about it is you know he makes god and the devil these very like kind of abstract religious concepts and figures into this very like tangible real thing that you feel like you can reach out and touch and that's what i think is like so unique about him as a filmmaker and i think that really comes from him having a documentary background and thus having this kind of working class attitude of like no i'm not i'm not fucking just like gonna set up a shot all day like we we got two hours run and gun it basically and you know i don't know if you guys have seen the the fridkin documentary yet but i i watched it like right after he died and it's so funny on there of him just being like 
no i only do like one or two more takes i basically like you know it's just like a pressure cooker like we got to get it now and like i'm not like overly precious about anything and it's more about an energy he's trying to that might have been late friedkin he was a maniac in the, oh really in the 70s yeah, yeah. He, he, i mean he came from a documentary background but he was one step away from a tyrant in the, in the 70s <laughs> interesting was, yeah i mean, I mean i've he, heard the stories of like on this movie him like slapping the actors and being yeah um you know he he's kind of like the reckless bad boy character and like if you guys have ever read easy riders raging bulls like of all the filmmakers you know who are covered in that book and kind of like very scandalous gossipy ways like his reputation is just like the chicago bad boy yeah. who is like you know breaking hearts and screaming at people and everyone was like that guy is insanely cool but also don't fuck with him yeah like you don't want to be on his bad side but at the same time god damn it he makes good movies mm -hmm. yeah, like, i mean he wasn't he wasn't spending hours and hours lighting a scene but he was certainly he fired plenty of cinematographers because it didn't look the way that he wanted it to i mean sorcerer took a year to, just to shoot right i mean he was there were delays I mean, he on this had thing the power to take his time he took his time and then well, all of a sudden he wasn't afforded that luxury and right and he kind of had to start making movies the way everybody else did he has the he had the flame for a short time and in that time right now i mean because you know this french is, connection and exorcist he had as much power as anybody this is oh yeah i mean i mean honestly, sorcerer is like to to borrow a, a phrase from another podcasts sorry to do that but no, it's, it's okay. sorcerer is like his total blank check movie of like dude you've won the you've won the oscar and you've made like one of the biggest movies ever like well i don't know what what do you want to do and he's like i want to remake this french movie about like driving nitroglycerin with trucks and i want to do it in the jungle and i would like people... to go to the jungle please right. i like to go to the jungle like, i guess this is how <laughs> much money i'd like and uh i'd like to go to the jungle know. no movie stars no 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 and i would also like you to release this movie in 1977 there's nothing else coming out during that summer so we don't have to worry about anything and it'll make a ton of money wait what, what? um uh so uh and i mean this production for this movie I mean, it was not. It was a bumpy ride as well. And yeah, there's all the the crazy behind the scenes stuff. It's another one of those where, I mean, shit. You just wonder how it, did it get made, and then it was made for twelve million dollars, which is a lot back then, seventy three, seventy two, and it made close to two hundred million dollars. Yeah, I think it was the fourth or fifth highest grossing movie ever at the time. Yeah, yeah. It is now in its re-releases and all that stuff. It's now closer to five hundred million dollars, which is insane. Yeah. So a hundred and what did you say it was one hundred and twenty? No, it was one hundred and ninety. One hundred and ninety. I did the old inflation calculator on it earlier today, and I think yeah. it was one point three billion by today's money. So it was one hundred and ninety. Making Barbie, Barbie money. In its end of its original theatrical run, it was one hundred and ninety-three million. Mm -hmm. It has a lifetime gross of four hundred and forty-one million. With subsequent re-releases it was made on a 12 million dollar budget yeah they made some they made some money on this one yeah i think everybody lived happily off of this thing um oh, and, yeah. and did well for themselves but obviously we're not here to just talk about all the behind the scenes and money of it all we're here to just talk about the movie in general and if he made a good one so jesse mm -hmm. thoughts on thoughts on the exorcist good movie oh i mean there's there's so many avenues to go down <laughs> um i mean we'll touch them know, all if we can we can we can do, i'm sure we'll obviously talk about this movie in the context of friedgen's career i kind of hinted at that a little bit earlier you know you could talk about this as just like in terms of the the cultural blowback that happened when it was released you could talk about it as like one of the undeniably like scariest movies ever made um you know you can talk about it as this really powerful drama about wrestling with one's faith and about like the destruction a divorce leaves but at the end of the day the real reason i wanted to do this movie is because you can do silly voices with it and that's kind of where i feel my my podcasting talents are, are that's at the that real area. legacy yeah this is, it's this really is just to, like about. scream your mother sucks cock and hell yeah on the microphone well that's why we brought you here because yeah uh, okay you got you Good. gotta reenact the whole thing 
Um, J Dog. Yes. Exorcist. Fan? No fan. Exorcist. Yeah. I mean, a uh, huge, huge fan. I, I, I will say the first time I watched this, I remember it, its reputation is yeah, this is the scariest movie ever made. And so, first time I watched this movie. I was like, oh boy, here we go. I'm about to need a change of shorts by the end of this one. How and, how old uh, were you when, when you first saw this? I, I was this was were within the last ten years. So I was okay. in my twenties. So okay. he still I, he still I, had I was, to change his shorts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was probably around like fifteen when I first saw it, but it's always interesting to hear like when I you come was, to I, these kind of like totemic movies that yeah, like, I think it was like, feel like you kind of grow up hearing about. I think it was like fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, yeah, which cool. feels kind of like the right time to watch The Exorcist, but I I never had. And so when I watched it, it was like, oh man, here we go. This is going to be the scariest movie ever. And then I, I remember at the end when I watched it for the first time, I was like, I appreciate how important that movie is, but I was not very scared by it. Mm-hmm. And I still to this day, I'm not particular. That I I don't find this movie particularly scary, save a, a couple sequences. But and especially now after this watch, Ryan, you you know this. Here this we go. gets the this gets the parent bump. I was this gonna is, say I know where getting, this is going. This is the getting this is getting the I'm a dad now bump for sure. Here, here we go. Where I now think the most compelling part of the film is just this idea of being a parent who has a sick child and you don't know why they're sick. Absolutely. And that is yeah. the true horror of the movie. Mm-hmm. And that that horror stems not only from this possession, but also from the essentially experiment medical experimentation that Reagan goes through in the in the earlier parts of the film. And we need to establish this. Which version of the movie did you watch? Um Whichever one that was on HBO Max, that's the one I watched. I don't know which one that was. Yeah, I've I've seen this so many times that I I did not, and I saw it recently within the last year or two to where I didn't revisit it for this pod. But I've I've probably seen both versions because I know of like the scene differences and stuff like that. Ryan, did um, yours have the spider walk on the staircase or not? Oh. I think it did. I can't remember. Oh, I watched this like yesterday. And I've had like a crap, a crappy day. Um, not to say that this show will be. I mean, crappy. you've seen it before. I'm sure you've seen. Yes, I've seen. Either, I think their version. I've seen but, both versions. Yes. Yeah. And, and and I I watched. I think it's only the second time I've seen it, but I um, watched the. They call it the director's cut, but it's not the director's cut. The director's cut is the William Peter Blatty cut. Hmm. It it's. It's the stuff that William Peter Blatty thought the film needed, specifically the ending of the quote unquote director's cut, which is not Friedkin's version. That's the theatrical cut. But um, the ending of the alternate cut has that kind of pleasant sequence between the the priest and the detective at the end. where They're like, let's right. go see a movie together. Let's go get lunch, uh, which was not in the original cut. Uh, and there's some other changes as well. I think generally the theatrical cut is better, but it's not significant enough that. No, it's just really like him. Differentiation. It's just him looking at the steps at the end. Yeah, and that's yes, yeah. yeah. That, that's the theatrical cut. It's him just looking yep, at the steps. That's the one I watched for cuts again to, for the cuts to black. Yeah, uh, that's which probably is, the one I've seen the most. I think. Yeah, I've that's only the seen definitive the, cut. Yeah, the director's cut once out of curiosity. Yeah, and then, yeah, and, and the director's cut. The spider down the stairs thing has actually become fairly iconic in and of itself, which is right. weird for another cut. The theatrical things you cut. think is in the movie, even though it's technically not. Exactly, exactly. it's been lampooned yeah. by like scary movie and other things. You know, what I mean, mm-hmm. like it's it's yeah. part of the zeitgeist. It's part of the. This is one of the most parodied movies. Ever. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Easily, it's also one of the most mimic movies of all time because every you know every movie about a possession. Right. Has, is is leaning on pretty much the legacy yeah. of this movie it's i mean that's why jay this movie not to cut you off but this movie is scary in the context of the time because people had not seen something like this before nowadays it, exactly. it's not it's not scary in for us it doesn't 
freaky it, out. See, no, see it, interestingly, I I think kind of the flip. Like, I think this movie, no one has t- been able to top it in terms of like, yes, there's been so many like possession movies, and it's kind of whatever weird magic Friedkin was able to conjure on this set. Mm-hmm. Like, it ended up with something that is more vi- viscerally upsetting to me than a lot of other the other possession movies that have sprung up over the years and yeah, so many people trying to do this idea. And I do think it kind of fits into kind of Jay, what you said about like the parent angle to it, which is like, I think Friedkin, I think the drama of it, he's approaching it as like, this is about having a sick child and there's nothing you can do. Like to what end will you go to, to yeah. save your sick child? That's what it's about less than sort of like, you know the spiritual religious aspect which i do think is there and that's i think a lot of william peter blatty and you know there's well that's certain... that wonderful balance right is right you have right. this skeptic and this man of faith kind of pushing and pulling against each other sort of like that social network thing where you have this idealist with sorkin and then this uber cynic with fincher that kind right. of balance is sort of the the magic of that in the same way that it's the magic here and I do think that Friedkin, when, when he was making this movie, Friedkin says, I wasn't setting out to make a horror movie. That wasn't mm-hmm. my goal when I was making this. I don't think that's entirely true in the latter <laughs> half of the film. He's obviously trying to make a horror movie. But the first half of the film, he's not making a horror movie. He's making a domestic drama, drama. that almost yeah. feels like it's about to become a weepy like right in terms of endearment or something it was uh, it, it it feels like a movie that like like you're saying there jay it's it's a it's it's not there's it feels like someone is sick rather than there is a possession there's no supernatural element right, to this right right until and there's this the man second of half science from, man of fate thing going on in yes. the movie that is so compelling oh and i mean it's one of my favorite parts that honestly the freakiest part of this movie to me is when they're doing the What's the thing where they stick the tube in her neck and it's exploding oh, blood? Oh yeah, that's the freakiest part of the movie to me. Well, I think the the freakiest thing is when the whole I, I'm the, or maybe when she the, shoves her mom's crotch or head in her crotch as she's. <laughs> <laughs> I think the freakiest thing for me, and it is just how they're able to capture the, and it's not even scary. It's just like I don't know how freaking did this. Um, was capturing how cold the room got during the the exorcism, yeah. And the possession. It was a, refriger- it was a refrigerated room. They yes. refrigerated it, and it's... they had everything. It got to like thirty degrees at night, and then they would turn the freezer off or whatever. Yeah, when they were filming, and that's and what they got happened. that effect. And so I think that the details of that, like Jesse, I, I agree with you. I think like I think that that no other film has been able to capture um a possession uh an exorcism quite like this ever since and nobody and and doing so that engages the audience fully in and for it to become a phenomenon i think every film has maybe a bit or a part of it but at the core of those horror movies is not that's not the the main thing like you know you go to a movie like the conjuring you're not going to that movie for the ending exorcism or possession of that. You're going for the jump scares. And I think that that's what most you horror need to movies give the conjuring a little more credit than that. I think the conjuring yeah. is good. I know. I, I'm I not. Really no, like I conjuring. love. No, I, I love I the, the conjuring closer thing to this is like, no, I'm, I'm just I'm just saying you're you're not going to that through and through for the you're possession talking about aspect. The yeah. you're, you're I'm talking about is that all other horror movies aren't singularly focused on that one thing and exploring mm-hmm. that one thing. I love that. Mo- Listen, Conjuring's in my top 10. Of the that Conjuring year, is interesting so. because it's, it's about marriage. Yes. <laughs> kind of no, 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 no. That movie so that movie's great. Um, whether it's factually correct or not, I don't give a shit about, but anyway, like what I'm saying is modern horror is different and focus and every horror film since has focused differently. Even its subsequent sequels in this series is focused differently than what freaking is focused on here, which this, is the domesticity a, of everything. You know? Yeah, this movie has a real like heavy dread to it. Like, yeah, even even it does have a weight know, to it to, yeah. to the point of like 
even the early scenes in this movie, even though, like you said, like it, 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 it just feels like you're watching a domestic drama. There's still this sort of like, I can't, I can't just quite describe this sort of like haze of like doom that's just sort of hovering over yeah. everything, and this feeling of just sort of like we, I don't know where we're going, but it's not good. And like, I think if you're looking at like modern stuff, like I think some of Ari Aster's movies, like Hereditary, I think kind of gets that a bit of that feeling. You know, there's obviously that great Japanese movie Cure that like is totally like envelops you in that slow bit of just like tiny dripping dread throughout the entire thing that just sort of builds and builds and builds Mm -hmm. um yeah it's got the shining i mean the shining yeah is the same kind of tempo and you know who was supposed to direct this there's three guys who kubrick turned this down kubrick was the first choice i'm glad he did the shining didn't i read mike nichols mike nichols was the second choice which Um, would have been fucking wild if that happened like I don't think it would be scary, but I think it still might be good. It would good. still be, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Nichols is a, is Nichols a, a journeyman? Or is he just kind of like a place filler? Nichols is one it's, of the most autoristic journeymen in history. Yeah. yeah I was that is say, yeah. Mike Nichols. Yeah, that's Mike, Mike Nichols. Mike Nichols loved a paycheck. Yeah, but he also was reliable. But he couldn't help just, but put his DNA into every yeah. movie he made. Well, it's like him and Lamette. Yeah. 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 He was like, listening to Lament Lamette talk, zone. and Lament's just sort of like, that was yeah. just how I worked. Like, I have to move on to the next yeah. thing. Like, I can't He's like, he something. can't not work. He was a, yeah. yeah. He made a lot of bad movies or middle Nichols of the road movies, Wolf. but yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, that was his exorcist. Exactly. Yes. That great example to pull from. That was his, him doing a horror blockbuster. <laughs> exactly. A terrible just, movie, but nonetheless, a really interesting, odd text. That is like ten times more expensive than you think it is on paper. Yes. Do you guys know yeah. about this? Yeah. yeah. Um, the third guy that turned it down was uh, Arthur Penn, who was the Bonnie and Clyde. That's uh, what he was kind of makes sense for the time. Kind well, of and then I think of, yeah. I think they got a different producer on this, and that producer had worked with freaking uh, for French Connection, and well, it was that and William was Peter Blatty. Ryan, I I talked about this. I think I can't, it might've been our first episode, but they originally brought Friedkin on to direct this uh, film adaptation of a TV show called gun. It was going to be called Peter gun. And he walked in and said, this script is horrible. I I wouldn't, your worst enemy wouldn't give you a script this bad. And it was William, (laughs) it was William Peter Blatty's script. And he was like, I respect the fact that you called this out. I know it's not a functional script. And he remembered that forever. And he sent, Friedkin a copy of The Exorcist when he was on the awards circuit for French, French Connection, Connection. Mm-hmm. and he said I have final director approval if you do this I will approve you and you can make this movie and he did which is it was a bit like man just you're winning an Oscar and winning best picture and then you get handed this opportunity which is probably like weirdly you wouldn't think like that's why I, I that quote that you're saying that freaking like I didn't think I was making a horror movie. It's like, well, you probably didn't think it, but by the end of it, you have fucking are. You know what I mean? Like it's in and it's such an interesting move. You're on the top of the world. You can do whatever you want. And this is the film that you want to make. And, you know, it's the most one of the most culturally relevant films of the 1970s. Yeah, uh, it's even more culturally relevant that the film that he won the Oscar for, which is mm-hmm. you know, which for most people is that's true. Still got people true. paying four hundred million dollars for the, the rights fucking, for an Exorcist trilogy, and he's probably very glad that he didn't have to fucking see the state of it right now. And uh, I think he's a believer of him. About, it's, like, it's gold. The it's David gold. Green quote is one of the funniest things that I think happened last. I year. have to believe that his spirit. That if you don't, if you're not a very religious person, you have to believe that spirits carry on into this life, because the fact that that movie bombed, and then after that quote, David Gordon Green is no longer attached to the series right. going forward. If that's not like divine William freaking hanging around to just make sure that this shit ends right 
I don't know what does because that, that's that it's almost too perfect, but also it just kind of makes sense because nobody's nobody again has been able to crack this code and do it. To people really the, like the third one, right? The third one's the good. other one that people like because that's I've the never one seen William a well, Jesse, you've seen believe. them all. I've so. seen them all, um, which I cannot say is a, a, a good thing to do. How many two, are there? There are, so if you include the David Gordon Green one, yes, there are technically five sequels, Okay, but I'm going to put a little asterisk there because I'll get to that in a minute and okay. the, tell the, me if the, I need to speed Paul up Schrader this little alternate yeah. version. Yeah, let's, so, let's let him cook. Yeah, so Exorcist 2, pretty awful. Like, it's directed by John Borman, who obviously did, like, Deliverance and um, what's the King Arthur movie? Esca- Excalibur. Excalibur. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's it just kind of misunderstands kind of what work. It gets more into sort of, like, the mysticism and, like, mm. weird, like, psychic abilities and there's, like, an unusual dream sequence where you're flying on the back of a lotus and there's tigers and stuff like that. It's a very, very kind of like schlocky, goofy. I heard movie. it is kind of bananas. Yes, it's it's bananas, but also like, and it has its defenders. Like I think Tarantino and Martin Scorsese have been on record saying they actually quite like the movie. I but I I would I would say I am with kind of the general consensus on on this one after having watched it that it's it's pretty bad like it's it's on the level for i'm not like a huge exorcist fan but like for people who that's one of their like four favorite movies the exorcist 2 has the kind of like bad reputation of like the phantom menace or something like that to uh, give you an idea of how much people like really hate I it like the like, phantom menace okay yeah well nobody's I, perfect I, you know what i, think I, I mean i like well i mean II. let's just say this i like the phantom menace in context to the other movie that comes after afterwards if that makes yes. sense. well that's that's fine but apparently yeah. the third one's supposed to be right but I'll, although third. i will say when he said tarantino i was like oh tarantino weirdly has kind of bad taste and then he said scorsese, scorsese and I and like, I went, oh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um can't, not with marty on that one but no three three is good i would actually like you know i don't know when this episode is dropping but it is like it's about to leave the criterion channel right now so if you haven't seen it mm. run check it out um yeah. like Actually, like I think a pretty underrated '90s movie from the horror genre. Interesting. Which, you know, the '90s is not a great decade for horror movies. Well, it's like um, if I'm not, and correct me if I'm wrong. So the second one is essentially like continuing the storyline through yeah, of Regan, Linda Blair. Yeah, yeah Linda yeah. Blair. Yeah, it's and then Reagan like the, has like psychic abilities. Yeah, and it's like, like turning her into There's the fucking shining. Long gaps yeah. between the movies. Yeah, and Linda then Blair like was pretty like a good bit older in two, right? Yeah, she's she's, she's definitely more of a teenager. It doesn't come out. She's forty five. I mean, years I guess old, it comes yeah. out like late seventies or something like that. So it's probably a good five. Yeah, four or five years later. It's not but, like now when they would have greenlit it opening weekend, it would have come out a year and a half later. Right. Yeah. And so, like the third one, is it like? essentially like more of like back to like basics a little bit more kind of. it's it's weirdly the plot of it from what i can remember is like it's more of a detective movie oh it that's... has like george c scott is in it as like the lead and he's like trying to solve these murders but they're like connected to a serial killer that he caught and was killed like years ago and there's this whole thing of like all right is the serial killer like possessing people is it actually then it then they find a way to connect it to sort of what happens uh towards the end of the first movie um i forget how it quite progresses and maybe i'm spoiling it a little bit but sounds like uh it's it's way more of like a a creepy detective uh exorcist movie than it is kind of like a continuation of the first film that sounds good that sounds like the pope's exorcist a little bit it's good yeah. it's good i, I haven't mean, I seen hope, the it, I hope it's better than the pope's exorcist hey you yes. leave that movie alone the movie rules the movie's all right uh, i mean it's fun he rides a vespa it's hell yeah he does yeah um, so then then there's four. basically two attempts at doing an exorcist prequel in the mid 2000s oh yeah so, that's right Paul Schrader comes in, doesn't write it, but directs uh, this movie called Dominion. That is, you know, prequel to The Exorcist, Stellan Skarsgård playing a young Max Valden Seidel 
version, um, even doing? though he was older than Max von Sydow when he <laughs> made the prequel. Fun yeah, little Max fact von Sydow was uh, what forty playing seventy in the yeah. first one. Yeah. Um. So, studio gets a look at the uh the the Paul Schrader cut. They're like, this is unacceptable. You gotta we we gotta throw this out. And they fire Paul Schrader. They bring on Rennie Harlan to reshoot the entire movie on a budget. So the Rennie Har both versions are terrible. Like to the studio's credit, the Paul Schrader version is, you know, to his defense, he gave them a Paul Schrader movie. It's a like very moody, like existential look at one's fate, the Ooh. guilt, and but it is like intolerably boring paul schrader is not immune to making a, a bad movie yeah, yeah. i i he wish i went into movies. watching it hoping that this was kind of the lost paul schrader masterpiece of like wait paul schrader did an exorcist prequel that's got a rule and then it, it really is like you know jay you could probably put this on for your your child and like send them off to sleep like it's that oh, much of a snooze um and then the Rennie, the Rennie harlan version of the movie is just kind of like looks like the really cheap looking like direct to dvd version of like the same movie with okay. like terrible special effects and instead of shooting on location they stop shot on like a back lot that looks like you know the bethlehem soundstage at your neighborhood church or something like that okay and then the fifth one real quick uh yeah the david gordon green one's bad it's just oh really bad. that's the oh that's the fifth <laughs> yeah, one. Oh, that's okay. the fifth one um and then that's I mean, I've seen it. It's not. It's uh, crap. It was truly terrible. It's truly yeah. like I that was one I, of I, the ten worst movies of last year for sure. I oh, can easily. I can say this. It feels like I'm a movie like, that they like test grouped and kind of like recut yeah. and tried to like. They tried to fix it. They, they like tried, tried to, to, fix to fix it, and they ended up just kind of like there was no way to fix it, and they just sort of screwed it up by like 10 times more by just kind of like making a giant mess of everything. I mean, the things, the thing about it is for me was watching it and just feeling as if not, you know, cause the, like a sequel thing is such a big thing nowadays and watching it. I just felt as if my, my soul had been crushed Yeah, and, and just, you know, trying to piece uh you've been all. possessed by yeah. the demon of bad yeah. movie making yes well and, and just... it's 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 really notable to experience you know everyone talks about experiencing a great horror movie with a crowd how fun that can be there's also nothing quite like the feeling when you know a horror movie is not working even with like average oh, show man. movie goer even with but like, with, especially like with the fans suckers yeah. yeah you can feel the movie is like trying to deliver you scares like it's the same as when you're seeing a comedy and like you Oof. i i identify that as a joke but like that that is has not the funny. structure of a joke that has the I structure of a nothing. joke but <laughs> no one is giving any reaction to it it's like dead silent in the theater that's that's kind of how it was watching exorcist yeah that movie is not scary at all i will yeah. take it to the next level than just watching it the trailer was one of the worst trailers I've seen. And the problem was, it's a universal movie. So every time I saw Oppenheimer, I'd see this damn thing during the summer. And I can tell you, every time I watched that with a crowd, with the quote unquote, as we like to call them, the normies out there, and, uh, those people were like, uh, no, thank you. And never again. Thank you. Yeah. When the, when the, it almost had the same effect. You guys know when like, when Shyamalan had like bad flavor and bad favor with, oh, yeah, uh, with, the with people, would, devil. people would groan like devil. in the theater. Yes. Yeah. When, when, the, when, when everyone up. was like, oh, cool. What's this devil movie about? And then, and then the like, haunted elevator from the maker M. Night Shyamalan. And everyone went fuck and from started laughing, laughing. Yeah. When Exorcist Believer came up on the screen, everyone went. I heard one lady literally behind me as I was seeing Oppenheimer go, nah. And it was it was like literally like that. <laughs> and that's really, what it really wins the award last year for like movie no one asked for. No one asked like, for it. You know, no one, we're gonna it, get we're the gonna whole get lead more. up to it was like, you've been asking for I, it. You've been waiting. It's finally here. Well, that and, is the and, thing. What it, it doesn't. You know what's about to have that? It's got one huge movie, but I don't feel like people were. No, 
No. Yeah. Even no one's ever one, asked which, for any of these things. I think the third one's good, but like the the third one is more of like a cult following. The third one was something where I like it's you stumbled like, into it. My, my super hardcore horror friends had yeah. to recommend the third one to me. Yeah, but you like, st- but I they stumbled into that. a good movie there. They didn't right. they don't like and you did it on the third one. You didn't do it on the second one. And that's the thing it's like yeah, no one's sat here with this even with an anniversary of a movie or whatever. No one has has been like, man, you know what I really need? I really need um I I really need another exorcist movie in my life let alone three and that's the thing it's like if audience has shown over the last couple of years it's like these legacy sequels these things that they've been waiting for forever they're not really asking for them or especially like this like there's probably like what 200 plus just movies about exorcisms in some way shape yeah. or form it's, it's not like yeah. this is an idea that is like you know solely exists Ooh, to, the, the, to the market franchise. is hungry for an exorcism movie right well it's because like there are other franchises now more modern like honestly i know i was not trying to uh, offend jay evidently but the conjuring movies or anything that james wan makes now in the horror realm that's what people want to see they do not want to see the Exorcist I mean, movie. I mean, the Halloween movies were a perfect example. Nobody asked for any of those fucking things. Those did the, okay though. The the yeah. the anytime they try to make uh remake when they try to remake uh Friday the Thirteenth or when they try to remake um Nightmare oh fuck on Nightmare on Elm Street. None of those things work. Like leave the damn classic horror franchises alone. It's like it nobody's is basically asked- the Conjuring verse and whatever a twenty four. Exactly. Those are the things. So leave it alone. You know what I mean? Like nobody wanted this, but anyway, all that side tangent to say, uh, this movie that we're here to talk about. Yeah, today, let's talk about the good one. Uh, the good one. Uh, it fucking rules. The best even one. still to this day, it's so good. It's a fucking great movie, and it has amazing performances in this movie. It has, uh, it has once again, Jay, a fantastic opening to this thing. The just opening a bizarre, this is a bizarre opening that the studio a, was like get get this uh, don't do this what why are you doing this like, and you know who you know who really told him not to do this who so i got some there's all kinds of good background. well jay get, give us the background to yeah, the, the, the opening. background yeah let's do i mean there's there's a bunch of ton, a fun uh fun behind the scenes stuff here but um so obviously the score for this film is is pretty famous at least the theme is but the theme was not composed by anyone new. This was something that Virgin Records basically had lying around. And they said, hey, there's a stack of stuff. Go see what you can find. You can have whatever you want. And he found this song, Tubular Bells. And Richard Branson claims that this was the first record at Virgin Records that sold a million uh, copies. He said that... That song made Virgin Records, uh, which was an interesting thing in and of itself. But he originally had gone to Bernard Herman, you know, the famous Hitchcock right. collaborator. He, he he said, you know, I would love for you to make this score. You, you're like a hero of mine. You're my favorite composer of all time. And he was like, yeah, I guess I could figure that out. Um, he said, do you want me to tell you kind of what I'm looking for? Nah, I'll figure it out. I'm thinking church <laughs> organs and Freakton was like, you want to do church organs for my exorcism movie? That sounds super cliche. And he's like, you know what, squirt, why don't you let me handle the score and you can, uh, you can kick rocks. And so Friedkin was just like, no, I'm, I, I don't want to work with you if that's how this is going to work. That, that totally, I mean, Friedkin's right on that. There's something I think about like, it's too on the, the nose. The, the gentleness of well, also like the gentleness of the bells that I think is like extra scary because I, I don't know, it's yes. just sort of it's auto audibly it's orally. It's you can tell it's really getting to to later in the evening after a long day at work. But it's asynchronous know, it's, to the the tone of the it just of, it's of it's the, the, yeah, it's discordant. It, you know, it, yeah. I think it connects to this idea of like it's this innocent child in peril. And having this sort of like right, sweet right. tinkly bell sound, the bells, and then to... a lot of piano score too. 
Right, right. I think the fact that the music sounds so gentle is kind of what makes it extra scary and extra menacing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, he he did some other score too. And then, as far as the lead actress is concerned, <laughs> uh, there were plenty of choices for that. Uh, he first choice was Audrey Hepburn. Actually, yeah, no. it was. I just, and that just would not Audrey Hepburn worked. was she read the script she said this is great I would love to do this by the way I am married to an Italian doctor now so if you can film it in Rome we can totally do it and Friedkin was like no no it's this place <laughs> in Georgetown we are filming in Georgetown, Georgetown. in New York uh, and she said so uh, bye bye Audrey Hepburn politely uh, passed and then yeah. the next choice after that and I texted this to Ryan this was an all-time text to me yesterday. The next choice was Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda. and that, uh, that would have worked. Buy it. That would have worked. It. I, honestly, it would have worked. It really would have worked. On on on. I'm, sli- I'm, I'm on glad we sleep. got Elaine Burstyn, but I I think she's perfect. But I I could see I cannot see Audrey Hepburn doing this role and it being go- as good. I could see Jane Fonda doing something. All, just, almost as good or just as Fonda good. post clute yeah mm. yeah no I, I think Fonda would have been good too but they they sent her the script and Jane Fonda <laughs> sent a telegram that supposedly. said supposedly why would anyone want to make this piece of capitalist ripoff bullshit so uh Jane Fonda passed and uh in in <laughs> in his memoir William Friedkin said uh I never learned how she really felt uh, so <laughs> the other that's, choice that's was the kind of like if I got that letter in the mail, like I don't even think I'd be mad. I would be like kind of like mildly amused or, or just sort of like, you know what? Uh, just for like the balls of it. Um, yes. No, you know, no. I, that, I, I, I'm going to, if anything, I'm going to frame that on yeah. a board. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, exactly. Then they, they wanted Anne Bancroft after that and she was pregnant at the time. So she couldn't do it. And mm. Ellen Burstyn supposedly reached out to Friedkin because she had heard that they were making this movie. And she said, I am destined to play this part. This, this is, I, I am supposed to play this character. And eventually Friedkin agreed and, um, thank God she she did. She got, she got the role and, and she's amazing in the role. And then obviously the other, well, there's two other huge parts in the film. The first is, um, Damien Karras and Roy mm-hmm. Scheider really wanted to play that role. Damn, he would have killed it. He lobbied. Uh, he would have fucking killed it. I'm yeah. so, yeah. He and do you, I, do you I'm not glad, like Jason Miller? I like Jason Miller in this movie. This is not a, a, a you know, Ima- slander to Jason Miller. version of this with Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda and, and Roy, Roy Scheider. Schneider. That would yeah. kind of, I guess, kind of also reuniting off Clute. Like, that would be yeah. interesting energy. That would have been really good. But it I, also, I I think they I think they got it right. J- I think Jason they did. Miller, Jason Miller, he was you know he's not an actor first. He's a playwright. Oh, yes, he is. Uh, Friedkin saw one of his plays and then met met the guy. And I think that's what adds to his sensitivity in the performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Schneider wouldn't be Schneider wouldn't be as soft as as he is. There'd be something a bit more kind of like yeah. There's something also up. too about his almost like his expertise but then yet his naivete mm-hmm. to the situation that i think is not there and yeah but with jason Bur- miller or scheider doesn't have the the again that sensitivity that you're yeah. talking about yeah no i no, i agree that's why i'm saying miller yeah. works i think i don't think i think it was the right casting again yeah yeah, I mean he's it Jay, worked Jason out. Miller's great. He he originally. I'm not changing any of the casting in this no, movie. No, no, by no. the way, he, it's, he it's like ten out of ten casting in this movie. Yeah, he 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 dismissed Friedkin's approach because Miller was having a lot of success as a playwright. He was like, I don't need I don't need this guy. I mean, I understand he made a good movie, but whatever. But then he read the script and he called Friedkin and was like, This guy is me. I need to play this role. And so he he got the role and then. The ball was uh, was rolling and production was underway and Friedkin and William Peter Blatty were really good friends, became really strong collaborators. And there's this one good story of uh, their meeting with the studio and 
Friedkin says, you know what? I figured out a good way to save us a little bit of money on the budget. We're only going to do one salad dressing for every uh, meal. <laughs> and, and the studio was like, okay, that's fine. What will it save us? And he's like, it'll save us like 75 grand for the whole production. And Friedkin is like, and obviously we're going to get whatever he said, a vinaigrette. And he told William Peter Blatty, I need you to be morally opposed to getting vinaigrette. I need you to say ranch or whatever it was. And they got in this huge fake fight in front of the producers under the assumption that if they got in a big enough fight, they would just want to stay out of their way was their hypothesis. There was these guys are really hard to deal with together. As long as they're making a movie that makes sense, we'll stay out of their way. That's fucking... Again, a little bit of Friedkin self-mythologizing. I, but... I, I love how Friedkin... I mean... It's over salad you know, dressing? Comes... <laughs> I just love how Friedkin's just this kind of like no bullshit, like kind of prankster Chicago guy. And like that... He's really like, just comes... stay out of my way. And you're right. Good. And like yeah. really comes off in interviews is just sort of like... I, I really just like don't give a shit like I, especially as he got older yeah. yeah exactly but I gotta tell you Jay that the the casting of, of Ellen Burstyn is one she's perfect in the film it's a it's a fantastic she is, she's so good she plays like saddened mother so so, so well. well and here's the thing if she doesn't get in this movie she doesn't win an Oscar the next year because that's the whole thing is she used the cachet. She, got some clout. It, she had some clout. She's in a, she's the lead actress or one of the lead actors in the biggest movie of the year. So what does she do her next year? She goes, I want to essentially win an Oscar or be in a lead role uh, in a movie that you just, you know, in movies that you just don't get to see. So she kind of forged with Francis for Coppola, who was a friend of hers at the time, uh, the idea for Alice doesn't live here anymore, which is the film directed by Martin Scorsese. And she saw mean streets and said, well, I've got to work with this guy. This is like based off of Coppola's recommendation. And so she put that whole movie together and basically got herself the Oscar and then she didn't show up at the Oscars and Scorsese accepted it for her. But talk about using your clout to then make something and build something. But yet if you're like, you're saying it was such a, it's a career defining role for her because then it changes her, the it's trajectory maker, of her. Really? It's yeah. It's a career maker. And Fonda who, who was coming off of winning for Clute in 72 so imagine if that what, what that would have done and if she had done it and Hepburn obviously like that could have been like that could have been the one for her because I don't think she ever won one but I I I um I think that she you're right she there's just these little things and there's just the softness of her as as this mother who is just trying to keep it all together but then when the possession starts happening and she has no one to turn to except to these these experts right in uh you know exorcism there is the the vulnerability that she's able to carry in, in those scenes is just impeccable work and um i think she has great rapport with linda blair i think linda blair's insane uh in this is movie this the best child acting performance ever i was going to ask that question debate. let's debate it. i was going to ask that question i think that that is legitimately on the table as one of the greatest child actor performances ever throw out some nominations the, the only um, other one that i can think of that rivals it is hmm. Haley joel osmond and ai which i think i was going to say like, Haley joel osmond but for six cents six cents oh interesting but for right i mean ai is totally valid and, and it's, young. it's it's notable that linda blair lost supporting actress this year to another child performance tatum o'neill and paper moon who's also it's, really good it's really good movie. yeah but i would give it to linda blair oh i would give um, it to linda blair as well but i mean if you're talking about like iconic child star performances it's it's you know it's funny that it 
she got upset by another child performance at the Oscars. Jay, this is something you and I we argue about all the time because this is a make or break thing for us. More bad child performances than good ones. Yeah, these are this is the thing that Jesse that makes or breaks movies for us in the modern era, Mm -hmm. Uh, and even going back when we're watching old movies. Jay and I will bump a movie up or down given how bad the child performances are. Like, oh, I gotta tell, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you a controversial thing. Go, go. And Jay's gonna get mad at me, but I've said this before. I felt like a little bit at the the reason why I was a little lower on Iron Claw than everybody else is that last scene with those terrible kid actors there. Uh, in that you're an absolute fool. <laughs> and I just, and I, I oh, just actually, like, you know what is? Did did anybody say Henry Thomas in E.T.? No, he didn't. Oh, but yeah, that's that's, that's really that good. Is, I mean, that is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. He's really good in that movie. Um, I'm, I'm now to... just looking up lists. On yeah, the, best the child Google. performances. Mm-hmm. In movie, you got to be careful with that Google search. So uh, who's good? And Gory Rice and the Nice Guys. That she's good. I, I would say, uh, what was his name? And uh, oh God, and come on, come on, the kid in Come On, Come On. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about. Can't but remember I can't. his name, but I definitely can't remember, remember his name. But I know what he uh, performance. Yes, I'm trying to remember it right now, and this is great for radio. Um, his name was Woody Norman. There you go. Woody Norman. Yes, he was very good in film. Um, yeah, very good. Anyway, I think that you're right. I mean, someone could say Anna Paquin. She won Haley an Stein Oscar. Is Haley true. Steinfeld I mean, in True Grit is really yep. good. Yeah. Some people will say, um, depending on how much you like Atonement, Saoirse Ronan's performance in that. I mean, I mean she's Jodie good. Foster in Taxi Driver. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, I get, that's another. Oh, that's, oh, that's a really good one. There's so many layers There's to that. There's been some good ones. Natalie Portman I, I and still, Leanna the Professional. I know. still feel comfortable saying Linda Blair because I, I, yeah. I think if this performance doesn't work, it's a disaster. If, if this movie, if this performance, this is I think also the other key to like why this movie, yeah, is so scary and so in, in a way that like other exorcism movies are not. Is like I feel like if Linda Blair's performance is off by like a fraction of an inch yeah it could it can still be an intense scene you can still kind of you know buy the situation happening but it's it's gonna lose that like extra little bit of sting there's there's something about like as we've kind of been saying like child peril is kind of the the big fear in this movie and like the way she is just like screaming and being like thrashed around on the bed Mm -hmm. and and just sort of like exuding pain like that's yeah. the thing that every time i've seen this movie is so unsettling to watch is like i believe that this child is like being tormented and like tortured like at every second it's like it's it is a movie where like the horror is i'm watching a child be tortured and like a mother trying to figure out like how do i help my child from not having this pain yeah i would i think that it's this performance in jody foster and in taxi driver because those are two performances that there's such an amount of risk to mm-hmm. both of them. And I think both of those movies hinge upon you buying into those performances 1000%. Um, but I would, I would, I would lean more a little bit more on this because Linda Blair has a lot more to carry. Like Sophia you're mentioning Coppola in Godfather three. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. think she's a child in that movie, but uh, I would not. Uh, I think that I has know. to be put just... in, the, in the teen Easter pile. Yeah, yeah. I would say uh, I'm not a good. Um, you know, maybe we'll talk about Sophia Coppola one day. Maybe just not for her acting. But um, I think that yeah, there's there's. I mean, Jay brought it up, but the one of the more horrific scenes in this movie is when they're trying to put, I guess, like the the the, the breathing tube down her throat, or they're trying to do the the the. Uh, whatever kind of procedure on mm-hmm. her right it and is called i wrote it down jay wrote it down and he's An gonna find it arteriogram in exactly when they're trying to do that which uh when i watched this with my wife she she noted uh they don't do it like that anymore and i went good Thank um God. and uh and but it was about it was this you know i feel 
her pain and, and, and you feel as like, because like I've said, possession movies nowadays, it's really all about like getting to the scares or getting to the, it's all really positioned upon the demon. Mm -hmm. And this feels very much more that you have gone on the journey with Regan the entire time inside, you know, we've seen her before and we've experienced her life and how it is. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the way in which Linda Blair is able to play this back and forth of the pre possession to possession to, um, just the, the varying degrees it's, it is a difficult, difficult thing to do. And freaking's able to get such a, um, such a free performance from Linda Blair in this. It's like, you know, it goes beyond just obviously like curse words and saying things like that. It is about, it is a physical performance. Yeah. And so it has to be 100% free. And that's what I think is so perfect about it. It, it honestly requires the biggest thing you need from a child performer in this movie is somebody who you won't, who won't just completely break down from right. Fearless. You got to be fearless. The trauma doing this. of yeah. this performance. I mean, yeah. it is, it's a big ask of a, what was she? 12 or 12, 13. When yeah. She made this something movie. Like that, yeah. It's a huge ask of anyone, especially a child to uh, even be confronted by the concepts of this movie, let alone be subjected to them in, in this imaginary setting. But they, there was uh, a part in Friedkin's memoir where he, he said he looked at a thousand, a thousand girls for the role. And he just wasn't sure if he was going to be able to figure it out. And, and you hear about this in Spielberg movies too. Spielberg has been, he's been trying to make that, what the Pope movie with Mark Rylance and Oscar yeah. Isaac, I think was something that was supposed to happen for forever. Right. And they just couldn't find, they couldn't find the kid. kid that could do it. Yeah. And, and so the, the movie has just not been made because of that. And I think that was on the verge of happening with this movie. And then, and then he came across uh, Linda Blair who wasn't, you know, he didn't have, she didn't have this, um, you know, actor mom, like the, the mom wasn't fully committed to her doing this, but she felt like she might be a good fit for, this role in particular, and when Friedkin talked to Linda Blair, she just seemed mature in a way that so many of these other kids kind of weren't. And she was grappling and understanding kind of the more mature content in ways that other kids weren't. And and Friedkin kind of decided this is the person who should play this role. And obviously they went forward with her and she's fantastic. And not only does she channel the exorcist sequence as well, but she's just a really likable kid. Yeah. When she's asked to be a really likable kid. And that's what makes the exorcism sequences so much harder. It's just that you, you do want this young girl to live her best life because she is so, so charming and, and down to earth. And I'll tell you one thing they did so, so well was the exorcism, the demon voice that comes out of Linda Blair. Oh, yeah. That sounds like possessed. someone like gargling with marble cigarette ash for like well, three weeks. <laughs> I got another little behind the scenes here. Here we go, uh, buddy. So the, the woman Friedkin could not figure that part out. Originally they had men do the voice and he was like, it should be, it should be something resembling a female voice. Yeah. And it shouldn't just be a dude. No, you know? no. And, and, and so Friedkin was kind of just going through his his memory banks, just who's a woman with a really distinct voice. And he was like, you know, I'm thinking kind of like Lauren Bacall has a really deep voice. Who's kind of like that. And eventually he came across. Um, oh, I'm totally blanking on her name. She won an Academy Award. So apologies to her. But um, he remembered this woman having this absolutely distinctive voice. And he reached out to her and said, Hey, I would love for you to play the voice of a demon. And she was like, man, my voice back then, I was smoking six packs a day, drinking all day. I would have to really channel that. But she read the script and said, I want to channel that. I would love to do this for you. And so he said they worked for like four weeks together and she was just smoking and drinking bourbon and downing raw eggs all day to get her voice to this place 
Right. Would it be? It also there. kind of sounds like I haven't seen the English language version of it. I've only seen the Japanese version, but the clips that I've heard of Robert Pattinson doing the heron and <laughs> the, the, the boy in the heron sound exactly like you know that voice that Jay yes, Joey. that is yeah. true. Jay, would the actress be Mercedes McCambridge? Yes, it Thank is, and much. apparently, as she was leaving the studio for the last time, she said. William, Billy, the one thing I ask of you is that you don't credit me on this movie because I want this to be about Linda. I want this to be her her performance. I don't want to overshadow her. Oh, that's way. nice. What a legend. But then apparently at the premiere, she said, Billy, I told you I wanted to be in the credits for this movie. What the hell is wrong with you? And uh, she was about to sue, and then they had to redo the credits for the theatrical release and put her in the credits. That's showbiz, baby. Yeah. That's a deep, That's someone saying, hey, don't you understand you can get money off of this? Oh, this movie yeah. is going to be a big deal. Big hit? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that kid? Uh, you did a lot of work for her. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some lawyer definitely was like, how do I get a piece of that movie's pie? And... Uh, yeah, she was she was an Oscar when she won. She did for a long time. She probably made a lot of money off of it. She probably did. I mean, she was an Oscar. You were right, Jay. She won Best uh, Supporting Actress for uh, uh, the original All the President's Men. So there mm. you go. Uh, what do you guys think of the Iraq sequence at the beginning? Fucking slaps. I I like it. I I like the ambition of it. Um, you know, like it's interesting. I rewatched for the first time since the pandemic. Um, that movie, The Empty Man from a few years back the, oh, like yeah. super underrated horror movie I haven't seen and it, it has like a, I need to see a, that. Sim- a similar kind of like sequence that's like a cold open in like the Himalayas I forget where it is exactly but a similar thing of like wait you're thrown off as an audience of like now I'm in this like foreign land that I, I have no idea where I am who are these people there's something kind of like ancient and kind of spooky about it and it's like the perfect mood setter for when you like go just back the, to the normal world just the idea of man continuously stabbing themselves in the foot and awakening things that they don't fully understand right exactly this idea of of, of it being spiritual but then and it's in you know in and around a very holy area of the world and it would be this you know the the origin of a very dangerous spirit that would possess this young girl and of course it would be at the hubris also of ambitious stupid men um as well so it's 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 there's a and it's shot so goddamn beautifully um i mean you you think of i think of the mirroring of this with the opening of sorcerer oh there's that long I mean, slow uh, zoom at yeah. the beginning that is just crazy good it's just something and a lot of a lot of the rest of the film feels kind of documentary like yeah it feels as if i think kind of kind of yeah. minimalist in its approach yeah which, which is what which i think is is notable for a lot of these you know 70s films that freaking does like i yes. think that, that gives obviously french connection I mean, it feels like in readiness and tactility. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, as I said, kind of earlier, like it makes, you know, these very like broad ideas of like God and the devil, this very like tangible, real thing. Um, It feels like it could be happening down the street. Right. Right. It feels like something that you can like reach out and touch on on Mm -hmm. the screen and that, you know, is just as likely to happen to you as like. Oh my gosh, my apartment's on fire in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean it feels very much it feels as likely as like your kid getting cancer. That's, right, exactly. That's, yeah. It feels as if, you know, they've got a real bad case of the flu. Yeah. You know? And the only r- remedy for that is a priest. You know? Um, because a priest in the middle of a crisis of faith. Exactly. <laughs> And Jason Miller is amazing in this movie. I think that that's actually some of the more like people. I mean, obviously what gets you in the door is the possession, Linda Blair, you know, right. and all that. What story. will make you question your faith more than the loss of a loved one? That's yes. kind of, or the potential to a loss yeah. of a loved one. And but I, I think that the think Jason Miller stuff like, is the Jason Miller stuff for me is just like the, the, what I love about the movie. Yeah. It's, I mean, I say crisis. this is someone who has a very complicated relationship with, 
you know, their faith. Organized religion. Up. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's all get into it. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I, I think <laughs> this is, this is, this is a great faith movie. I would tell, like, I have like, you know, very religious members of my family. I would like gladly tell them like the exorcist is a great Christian movie. I mean, you know, there's a weird deep dive we could do on this is like, is it ca- Catholicism propaganda or something like that? But, you know, like it is it is a great movie about grappling with your faith when you've like lost someone and you're like, I don't know, the world seems like a terrible place. There probably isn't a God. And this man having to like go on, you know, he's a Paul Schrader character having to like go through his own, you know, journey with faith in order to like find it at the end and like make this sacrifice for like mm-hmm. the better of this girl. And yeah. there was, I, I, you know, there was a lot of pushback because Freakin was doing a lot of consultation with um, Catholic priests and all that stuff. There was a lot of pushback to Karis uh, jumping out of the window at the end of the film. Cause they were saying, you know, there is no salvation in suicide essentially is was, was their argument. And he was saying, no, he's not doing that. He's, doing it to kill the the demon which is an interesting kind of yeah you know is it martyrdom and is that validated i, I, I don't know it's a very complicated uh, faith based idea right but um it it is a film that is not judgmental whatsoever of religion one way or the other no. which no. I, I think is one of its great uh powers because mm-hmm. Friedkin is not an atheist. He kind of describes himself as spiritual, but not connected necessarily to any dogma one way or the other. He definitely says in the documentary about him in like the opening interview, I think Hitler and Jesus are the two most interesting people who've ever lived. So that's if that gives you any kind of idea about and he like elaborates. He's like, you know, one's pure good. The other's pure evil. I think that's interesting. Most well, that's of his whole like thing that. is there's yeah. good and evil inside of, of everyone. He said they, they asked him, you know, does the devil exist? And he said, I think evil exists in whatever abstract way you want to envision it in every single yeah. person. I think he's more interested, though, in the in what I think a lot of great directors are, which is the morally gray. Um, yeah, yeah, he's of, all of about he's he's all about the the. the in, in the French Connection, it's about the intersection of justice Good, and yeah. Right. criminality. Yeah, I mean, this is all. I mean, this is literally, you know, God and the devil, and but then also to your own relationship with with religion and, and your own relation. And I think as an and that's why I think it's such a striking film for the nineteen seventies because I think audience members had to ask those questions inside a horror film. I think that there's some aspect like Jay, what you're saying about getting the parent bump and about being about losing a child. I think that that is what upsets so many people in the 1970s for sure, especially families and parents, you know, because of the idea, like maybe consciously or unconsciously not thinking. I mean, definitely there was a lot of like religious organizations and zealots who were just out there like the, but also, it's right there in the fucking in the in the text of it all too. It's it's. But the it's thing about this movie too was, oh, there's a dozen people leaving, just throwing up in the aisles. Yes, the there, the there's when yeah. The movie came out, and it's just like, uh, which is bizarre. Which yeah, I mean, hindsight. if you, uh, my dad saw this in '77, um, and he thought it was the funniest fucking thing. He thinks it's a comedy. He doesn't think that it is a drama. He thinks like it is, um very much steeped in like melodrama too and very over exaggerated and he was just like i don't get it everybody was screaming he took a date to this because like that was the thing you just did back then you took a date to a horror movie she was terrified is what he said and uh, he was just like i don't get it and she was just like you didn't think that was scary it's like not even in the slightest you know <laughs> like not even close and 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 so and i don't think it's i i think it's creepy at times but i don't think it's scary i think that but the ideas of what is a movie you think is scary like genuinely scary does it have to be a horror movie are you asking me what a horror movie or do i not yeah probably a horror movie not like i think the scariest movie of all time is synecdoche new york it is not a horror movie (laughs) but it makes me think about death on a level that i am very i think that yeah i think that i don't get scared by horror movies uh i think i get scared more by fucking existential dramas like you know i get scared by um, is the shining scary 
I would say The Shining is scary for some. Definitely, uh, yeah, I would say The Shining is is where I would say is scary. When I watched The Shining, when I was a kid, that movie terrified me. But now I, my, now I think it's just beautiful. You know what I mean? I don't know, Jesse, what you think is like. Yeah, a scary I mean, The Shining movie. is interesting because that definitely like w- would have been my easy answer for a while, but I've seen it so many times. Yeah, that, that it's like it's right, washed over true. me now. It's, it's I've been numb. I mean, to like it. just I mean, Jay, are this you is, asking like a movie that's still scary to us? Like you're still terrified I, I about think it? Is there is there a movie that's come out recently that you had never seen before that scared you? Um, I mean, I remember being very very like having nightmares for multiple nights after i first saw hereditary mm. you know i don't think skin how to define skin rink but there are definitely like a couple moments in skin rink that like i freaked me out i don't know that i enjoyed the entire experience of watching that movie but that i guess that was the most recent thing that like freaked me out and you know i i think there's have either of you ever seen the japanese horror movie pulse no, but I've heard I've heard this is really there. Great. There is a scene in there. I think if you were to ask me, like, what is the scariest moment you've ever seen in a movie? Like, it's either this one moment in Pulse or it is there's a scene in Exorcist 3 that actually that's like the greatest jump scare ever. There like, is I a, mean, there's I, a moment in. Um, did you guys see Talk to Me? Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah that's another yeah. one. That's another one. That I wasn't, like I wasn't out. terrified by the movie, but when they, again, another possession movie, essentially, uh, when they are talking to the demon and you see the essentially, what this movie does so well, but in that movie, the glimpse of that demon or this collection of demons eating and feasting off of her brother's body. Yeah, the visual just glimpse of seeing that was terrifying. Yeah, that being said, the rest of the movie is fine. Like I wasn't, I was like, and nothing lived up to that five seconds of that. Yeah, movie. that is kind of it. I'm looking at the movies and I'm, I'm thinking there was a know, there was a there shot. Were, there were parts of Nope that I found genuinely. Yeah, the scary. digesting, the, the digesting scene and the digesting scene. Yeah. I think are both really. There scary. There were a couple scenes in Old that I found genuinely scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my god. Well, Old's also just another one of those like the there were body horror, Invisible terrifying. Man that I found genuinely scary. The movie um, Nighthouse. I'm, I'm not a big like oh light oh yes the lighthouse is or no, the, the night, night house. house is that the one with Rebecca uh, yes uh, Rebecca Hall, Rebecca Hall. Yeah. yes um, Invisible Man I remember seeing that with with Megan at home and I thought that the the jump scares in that were actually really good. And but as it, I'm it looking at scary. the last movie that really overwhelmed me with a sense of dread and I think I found it I think it was Suspiria. The yeah, Guadagnino Suspiria. I That's, you know I what? should I should revisit that. That's one I I remember liking it, but I kind of walked out with being like, hmm, and then like went on with my day, which is sort of like in, interesting, and yeah. and then kind of didn't think about it anymore. I I think maybe because like I love the Dario Argento yeah. version so yeah. much, and I was just like, huh, interesting that that was his take. And I, then, love, like, I love that movie. I also think there are scenes in Godzilla minus one that are genuinely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Quite scary. I think. Yeah, there are. There, I mean, shit, Jay. I think that. I mean, honestly, and I'm not I'm not being hyperbolic about it. I think the ending of of, of Oppenheimer just scared the shit out of me because I was like, oh, yeah, well, that's yeah. again, that's an existential. Yeah, but I, but I don't to. think but I don't think Godzilla is but I don't think Godzilla is a horror no, no, movie. The scene, no, the scene, the scene where he is destroying the city to me was genuine. No, no, it's genuinely terrifying. But I, but I don't upsetting. think but I don't think those movies are horror movies. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. No. You know, mean, that's I, what I was saying. I thought you were entering that room, but I was like, no, yeah. no, no. I mean, like, I think that uh, what is it? Um. A movie I'm not like like I thought it, there were generally like some creepy scares, but I was in a theater full of people. Was when I saw I was at the premiere of Smile at a Fantastic mm-hmm. Fest. I don't like that movie overall. I think it's a little too long. Um, and but early on those scares, are like especially like setting it all up and everything, were some really like inventive ways to like get me to jump in this in my theater. Like Never I was. Saw it. It's 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 a fine film. Like it made a good chunk of change. Uh, I wouldn't, 
again, it. I, Why do they smile? Um, I don't know. It kind of they kind of really don't explain it. It just is like a. Right, Jesse. It's like a. Did you see the film? It's, it's I, like a, I didn't, but I was running through kind of uh what funny Ron DeSantis negative <laughs> can I come up with that will somehow tie into that? Ooh, or, hungry. My, my brain Ooh, was, hungry. was busy yeah. racking. Um, no, I did not. I did not see Smile. Oh my God, Jay! I, I watched. What that. was a good? You know, a movie had a couple of good little scare sequences. Crawl. Yeah. Oh, are you talking? Good. You talking Crawl about uh, with the crocodiles? Yeah. yeah. Or alligators? Crawl rocks. Or whatever. Yeah. Oh, Crawl rolls. Um, I remember uh, when uh, you know. uh, one that I this is an unusual pick, but I think is is actually like one of the scariest, most upsetting things I've ever seen. Uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me. Yeah, that whole fucking thing. Anything with David Lynch. Scares you yeah. don't like Fire Walk with Me, right, Ryan? No, or, but or oh, I thought it's he, lesser oh, I thought Lynch he, for you. It's also Lynch, but there's still some terrifying. I mean, like I anything, love Firewalk. I, mean, any, I, any I do too. I acknowledge all of its faults, but it's just sort of become a yeah. thing that, like, it is. It is well, so powerful, just in spite of all of like, Lynch has the, the greatest jump scare of all time, and yeah, uh, and Drive. Twin Peaks, yep. the Return yep. as well. The, yeah, I think Twin Peaks is fucking t- anything in the the Red Room is just fucking scary. scary. Yeah, it's some terrifying shit. Right. Um. Um, you know what's terrible? You know what's actually a really good set piece. We haven't really talked about it a lot. Is the, is the 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 exorcism? Yeah. The, the like the the titular exorcism. How long do you know? think he'd last in that room? Uh, As who the Max von Sydow character? The, you're just you're just there. Like you're you're assisting. Like how long do? You oh, think I'm he's, assisting. He's yeah. Max von well, Sydow. Like I, you know, I need someone who to like come in here with me. You know, I think I could handle it pretty well. Emotional support like priest. I don't right, think exactly. I mean, I think I'd handle it for. I, I give myself a good amount of time. Like I don't want to touch her or anything. But like, I, I think I would be so wrapped up in it that I couldn't help but stay. Yeah. But I, I think I, as soon I, as it was over, I would be like, I wish I had left fifteen seconds after I entered in that there. room. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Jay. You and I would like. We wouldn't be faced by anything that fucking demon bitch would say, but then like at the same to at the same time, later on when we're we're coming back to it and thinking about it, I'd be like, "Wow, I was what she was there. saying." It would be the way that it was said. Said, yeah, it's the tone. Are you a, saying tone person, matters? You know, some sometimes somebody will have an outburst where it's so bad that you can't help but kind of laugh at it. So yeah, you just kind of do you do you think if when she you know tells yeah, the, the priest your mother Say sucks it. cock in hell like do you think yeah. you would be able to have a straight face or would you be like would you have kind of kind of a chuckle and then the priest would look at you and yeah I'd probably be like sub dude is that true I, yeah, I, mean, I, like, I do yeah. think given you know depending on when it happened what the entire context was how much I knew I could definitely see myself laughing at that. Yeah, as yeah. like a, this girl is sick and is having these like outbursts, yeah. I would laugh at it. I think I'd laugh. But at it. if I knew there was a demon in there, <sighs> get the fuck out! I mean, here's I don't the think thing: it would be very funny. The other like, thing too like, is like I'm you gonna... walk in and like Reagan's fornicating with the the cross. Like, are are you like I need to get out of here, or are you like? Well, in that instance, we're talking of, about do you kind of violence. chuckle in or like? Okay, yeah, I think like, no, that's I'm, yeah. I mean, like I'm that's. Buckle up. I'm seeing blood, and I'm seeing, you know, her shove her mom's head in her crotch. Um, I'm doing something about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say that. Yeah, I'm thinking. I think I would be out at that point. I'm and you know really, what? You know what? A lot of the power the film comes from as well is just the fact that Chris is not a religious woman either. No, no. None of them he are. Is just it's just as much about her like wrestling with this like this faith thing sounds scary, but also like I don't know I don't how know. else to explain this stuff. Yeah, but really, she's, she's just none of the treatment has been working. I will try anything. Anything. Yeah. It's a. It's the. It's the idea that what's a more. Uh, what are you going to put your faith in? Are you going to put it into medicine that might not work? Or are well, you going to put it true. into? You are putting when you are 
unless when you understand medicine, you're putting your faith in doctors. Well, even mm-hmm. still, there are, at that time trial runs and different things of that uh, of that nature too, Jay. So it is still either way. Experimental leap, medicine is as much a leap of faith you know. than than regular prayers and and all that stuff. So it's so essentially you have to believe in something and and or not even believe. You're just you're hoping for something throw something at the wall and see what sticks exactly and if it's religion god god bless you and it sounds weird and it sounds crazy but people have turned to far worse things in order to get peace in their in their world and their and so i and i don't think that it's that's the non-judgmental part of the movie that i really do love yeah you too i mean she's she's it's just it a kind mom of reminds me of the end of um did either of you watch the leftovers the damn hell yeah oh, hell, hell yeah, yeah. Like the, that's the whole thing like that final scene with carrie coon and justin throw <sighs> is is about or like at least to me is about is like him saying like it does or you know when he says i believe you like yes it's nice if he like really means it like i believe your crazy story about going to another dimension but if he actually doesn't believe her but is saying like okay i'm glad you have found peace right like that is that whole scene to me like that's that's religion it's like and that's you know people i need to believe in something in order to you know have peace with life i need to rationalize this in some way no matter how irrational that may be right and uh, how you know we point at each other and like but your belief system sounds crazy or something like that and like it all sounds crazy if you're like step away from it, but yeah. it's like, what do you, what helps you be a better person? If that makes sense. Yeah. That's one of my probably 10 favorite shows ever. I'd love the leftovers. So good. It's like my second favorite show of all time. I, well, you one up to me or you, you nine up to me. I nine up to you where it's at. Eight, eight, eight up to me. I don't know if it's a 10 for me. I don't know. It's, it's probably, like it's probably in that like five to eight range somewhere in there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's two. What's your favorite show of all time? Mad Men. Mm. Easily. Jesse, what's your favorite TV show of all time? I watch Mad Men. I feel good about it. Twin Peaks? Uh, I think mine might be Twin Peaks too. Damn it. See? See? Of like, there's other shows that I consistently like more episodes, but I think like, what is the show that best defines like my TV taste? Yep. That's exactly the point. The thing about about Twin Peaks is there is half a season that is genuinely not that good. No. no, yeah, and like, he, but you can justify kind of it give, being good like, for you. you yeah, know what I mean? yeah, and then the return I think is one of the best pieces of art that has come out in the last twenty five years. So yeah, I mean, I've been I've been telling people within the last couple of years that like the bear has now become one of those shows where it's like I love the bear. It's so much like a distillation of just things i'm interested in and aspects of my personality that like it's weird for me to talk about it with people because it's just like this just feels like someone like put a bunch of things i like in a blender and then like this is what came out of it yeah i just recommended the bear to my brother and my brother i was hanging out with him the other day and he said uh yeah i watched season one of the bear i was like oh what do you think it's so great he's like that's okay i mean it's pretty good and i was like you're an you're an idiot feel sorry for him yeah i mean but i did tell him season two is better than season one so that is true i like season i like i haven't seen season two yet i need to watch it season two is one of the better seasons of television to come out that i've seen in a long time there's a lot of good tv coming out man a lot of good tv coming out true detectives cooking again i heard i'm behind on it um i'm interested in that um that uh glover mr mrs Smith show Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that looks like it could that be fun. Good. That looks like a fun time. I'm looking forward that to that new Lulu Wong show. Yeah, expats. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to um to the feud, uh, the second season of feud. I'm looking forward to the uh, what is that show? Um, uh, the 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 it's oh god. Looking forward to any time Taylor Swift is on an NFL game. Nope, not looking forward to that. Um, I'm tired of that propaganda. Is this, um, is this where we can have a a no tangent about like how no. every sports store in the country no matter what state no matter what team there's always like taylor swift on chiefs no there's always chiefs merch there's now because all the swifty girls like buy. look the nfl is love they're getting five to seven million viewers extra every game yeah they're getting them on that peacock i'll tell you they want to see uh taylor 
Yeah. You know? I feel like this is disrespectful. Honestly, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I feel like I, this is... I, I like it. I need to stop you. You're being disrespectful to The Exorcist bringing up Taylor Swift, and that's... I'm not going to... This is that. the second podcast in about the last six or seven that we've brought up Taylor Swift, so... I need you Taylor to stop. Taylor Swift and I have the same birthday, so... Wow. It's, well, I'll, I'll... What are your eras? God damn what it. are my eras? Don't... Yeah. Jesse, don't, don't help him out with this. <laughs> this is not... Dude, I need, like, a set number. I feel like if, if you give me unlimited choices, then, you know... We're gonna be here too long. We'll let you I mean, just just figure it out next time you're on. We'll go over it. Okay, maybe I'll, a bonus episode. Can I do like a live PowerPoint that then gets like put on social media? Yeah, yeah. We'll pivot to video for okay. the PowerPoint. That'd I be hate, great. I fucking hate you both. <laughs> I fucking hate you both so much. Um, is there anything else you guys would like to t- talk about or say about the Exorcist before we get out of here? Um, oh man, I'm just gonna miss Billy and his sass. God now that he's no longer with us. I do miss King of Sass. directors used to be so petty and and I love that and then you hear Paul Thomas Anderson who obviously we love I love like say stuff bear like now. never make fun of anybody's movie they worked hard on it and it's like oh, you know, know what no make fun of somebody's movie just do it and like you look at early PTA interviews and it's like oh he's this, such this a guy, brat I love this guy's movies but this guy is like insufferable to li- like yeah. I would hate talking to this guy at a party <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 interesting how much he has changed. But I mean, every director should have to make like uh, De Palma, that De Palma movie. Everybody oh, yeah. should just have to make one of those, and and we'd I be mean, better if... off for it. Or they did the um, who is it? Um, the Her Smell guy. Oh, oh, um, Alex Ross Perry. He, he did a Paul Schrader. That's right. That's like coming yeah. out or something. Um, it came out also... a, a, a couple of years ago, I think. Listen, uh, if, oh, really? if, if it was like a forty, it was like a forty-five minute thing for Criterion Channel. Oh, okay. Uh, and it, listen, it was it was really interesting. Listen, if Schrader... I TCM did like those things, oh, I was in like middle school, but they did one for Spielberg, and then they did one for Scorsese that was tied to The Departed because I remember it's it's on the Departed DVD hmm. that I had as a teenager. That you know, if you want to hear those guys basically do a very similar thing i i just think they're about a decade behind but i just think that if if schrader's going out there fucking you know all these people talking shit about you know really you know like all these movies i mean he was out there didn't he love barbie or hate barbie or something like that or hate this movie or schrader just talks about everything if schrader can go out there and say anything i think you can be a little bit like i agree with schrader's take on the zone of interest of course yeah well, what do you I, feel about schrader's bar or uh not barbie taylor swift takes he fucking likes got his, it he's got it figured out she's gonna be in his next movie I guarantee you could you imagine her and her a and jacob sh- a lordy that'd be that'd, that'd be a be, hoot that would be a movie that's for sure would that be then the most widely viewed paul schrader movie ever in the history of ever probably um, but don't you also kind of want to be there opening weekend for when like like imagine the crowd oh, that would for be like spectacular the tour, but like they sit down and they get like a weird paul schrader movie yeah they get like the car why counter? was taylor swift writing in a journal for 45 minutes, <laughs> right? why are there sheets on all the pieces of the furniture and why has she tied it down you know what i mean like uh no why did I, taylor swift hate herself so much she didn't yeah. have to do that well not i mean expecting taylor swift to uh art imitating life at that point at the end that was weird <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you one scene in The Exorcist that I really love is the scene where the two priests, after the first try at the exorcism, are just sitting on the stairs, yeah, just silently. And in the director's cut, they have a conversation, which I think is worse. No, I think the silence is good. I think the theatrical cut. Let's just let's just point this out. The theatrical cut of this movie is the cut of this movie. Yes, I I think so, and yeah. I actually think. Which is the William Freakin cut of the movie, essentially. It, it is. That is the, yes. the director's to. cut is a is a misnomer. Yes. Although yeah. Friedkin has been known to tinker with his movies. A little yes. Bit, I mean, but, sure. But I mean. But that is not ta- the case with this one. He he does revere this movie, not of its legacy, but of this movie specifically as like, this is one of his babies. He yeah. is very proud of this movie. That's why the the David Gordon Green quote is fucking hilarious because he's like, this precious thing that I made, this piece of this I- iconic piece of work that I worked my ass off, that I created, that people loved or hated, regardless, it 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 
punctured into the zeitgeist and has now been butchered and butchered and butchered. And now to the tune of $400 million, they're going to butcher it three more times. And none of them have ever worked. And why would they start now? And I pray to God I never see it. And then it was so sad <laughs> that he passed. But it's also kind of like darkly comedic about it. Yeah. It's like he makes those comments and then he's gone. And then again, I feel like his his spirit is around fucking over this franchise now in the only way he could do it. Like, oh, because think about it. An Exorcist Believer movie. In, that is premiering its trailer in front of the biggest one of the biggest films of the summer to get people anticipated and it makes fucking nothing at the box office essentially and is critically one of the worst movies of the year if that's not like him coming back around that's what i'm saying is maybe he is actually spiritual after all because because he's hanging around here it's 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 great but i agree with you jay there are just moments like i think of the conversation between um between Karis and Chris when they first meet I think it's a better character drama than a horror movie hot take I think that they well I think it is a character drama with with horror elements it's like, it's kind of it operates it in a similar way both. to me as yeah. Rosemary's oh. baby I like it yeah. more than Rosemary's baby I would say but I also Rosemary's baby movies. is a movie I have not seen since I was 17 maybe like it's Rosemary's Baby is very old. good. I think I like this a little bit more probably, but Rosemary's Baby is very good. Both five okay. star movies. Easily for me. Love Rosemary's Baby. But I love this. Well, Ryan's I... just a huge Polanski guy. <laughs> why do you do that? Go off. Why do you why <laughs> No, I'm not gonna <laughs> Ryan keeps begging to do a Polanski series. And Jay's been He's like right Woody Allen? Woody, Woody. That's what Jay's been saying. I'm like, calm down. We get it. All right. I'm trying to do Melly Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> brett ratner those are your boys oh man i'm a proud member of the rat pack oh my god <laughs> anyway jesse anything lastly you want to say about uh exorcist uh only that it just popped into my head because we're having this conversation that yeah. there was also an exorcist tv series that was not that long ago that's right holy that shit true i forgot yeah. about that good weren't there pretty important people involved with that yeah too? who who was in oh, that i feel like there was someone was it gina davis was in the ellen burston role ah uh, the exorcist uh lovely once again for our, our listeners out there yes um, gina davis gina uh, davis yeah oh. is she literally no, yeah, she's Gina, not. She's, she's in it, in but it. she's she's not. Yeah, they're not the same. Is it related directly to the movie? No, I have it's no a clue. Sequel I just remember to the it, 1973 film and ignored. Oh, they Halloweened it. Yeah, they ignored the sequels. Okay, okay. so it's yeah. I never watched it. I just remember it being on and being advertised everywhere. But nobody plays. But oh, nobody, Gina nobody. Davis plays Reagan. Oh, so is it Reagan's grown up, and then yeah. now her kids are getting? Did she bed? change her name or something? No, Reagan. Reagan plays or uh, Gina Davis plays it like uh, Martin Short in. Uh, oh my God, I'm ruining it because I can't remember the name of the movie. What's the one where he plays a kid? Oh, what is that movie called? Oh, is it Stu? No, God, it's not Stewart. You're about it's, to say uh, Stuart like the guy in Mad TV? Yeah, I was about to say that. <laughs> All I'm thinking about is the bad Robin, the Francis Ford Coppola Robin Jack? Williams movie. You're yeah. thinking about Jack? Yeah. No. But I do yeah. know there is one with Martin Short. It's oh. actually kind of good. It's not called Arthur, is it? That's no. something else. No, right? that's literally a movie called Arthur. Um, Crap. Damn it, Jay. I know. I'm sorry. Now you're making me look up this Martin Clifford? Short. Is that it? Clifford. 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 There Clifford. it is. Clifford. 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 For Gina. God. Yeah. I thought we'd never Gina get out Davis. of that. Gina Davis does a Clifford <laughs> and plays a 14 year old girl as a 60 year old woman. How many people really? do you think are uh, no. are listening no. to this? And are you like, went all the way around that for that stupid joke? <laughs> 
God, go it on. would have been pretty decent if I had thought of it on the spot. But yeah, and then you just went down this fucking Clifford rabbit hole. Clifford, absolutely <laughs> now, now demented film. Wonderful... Recommend. Now there's this wonderful tangent where, like, if someone's listening to this and they're like running down the belt line, then everyone's <laughs> looking at them because they're like screaming, like, Clifford, it's fucking Clifford. But there's also these people being like, Gina Davis did what? And then, like, and then, yeah, so we just commentated our own commentary there. Anyway, um, Jay. Yes. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. Talked about a, a very good film, The Exorcist. You relax? Really makes you think about life in many ways. Uh, you know, after watching The Exorcist talking about it, I wouldn't say I'm fully relaxed, but I'm no? contemplative. I'm mm -hmm. at peace. You ready to play? a little bit better about investing in that uh, anti demon spray? Yeah, I got I, I keep it on me like the shark repellent that Batman had in the Batman movie. That's... My anti demon spray. There you yeah. go. Well, Jay. We are going to test your award season knowledge based on the film we mm -hmm. just reviewed, which is The Exorcist, in a segment we like to call It's an Honor to Get Nominated. Uh, Jesse, this is a game that we here at Awards Watch we do for Jay because he is uh, awards uh, illiterate. Averse. Yeah, averse, oh. illiterate. Um, and essentially, he's not very good at it. And uh, so we test him on the films that we just reviewed to see if uh, these movies were nominated for Oscars or not. Uh, you can help him out if you want to. You don't have to. It's uh, even better when nobody wants to help him because then he has to squirm his way I got, through. I got it pulled up, but I, I feel like I want to I want to yeah. see the don't, man. If you have magic. it pulled up, don't help him. Uh, I just kind of want to want to want to look at the I want to see. Thread. Yeah, I want to see what he's uh, what Jay has made up here. Jay. Yes. Was the Exorcist nominated for Oscars? And if so, how many was it nominated for, and what did it, it win? It certainly or, or was nominated it... for several. I, I think in many people's minds, it was sort of uh, one of the front runners for Best Picture. Yeah. And according to William Friedkin, again, the man has been known to stretch the truth. You think? He claims that there was a little bit of a vendetta against The Exorcist this year. He a was little told bit? by people that they said, if this wins, this will change Hollywood forever for the worse. We can't let this happen. Mm. He claims the number public enemy number one of The Exorcist was George Kakor. He mm. says that he was adamantly, publicly, or not publicly, I guess, privately, behind his back being like, not The Exorcist, not The Exorcist, not The Exorcist, which I thought was an interesting enemy to have, uh, especially at this time. But. Mm. Uh, it was nominated for Best Picture. Mm -hmm. Correct. It was nominated for Supporting Actress. Correct. Was it nominated for Actress? I'm going to say it was nominated for Actress. Correct. I think it won for Sound. That's correct. Uh, it had to be in for Editing. Yes. I want to say it won that one. Nope. Ah. You're, you're, you're uh, direction. Roll. That is correct. Freaking got in. Screenplay adapted. Yep. Oh, man. Production design. Which was called art design, art director, uh, uh, art direction at the time. Yep. Um, what else is there? It wouldn't, I think, have gotten in for score because it didn't really have a ton of score, and the main mm -hmm. theme was. Mm -hmm. This is good stuff. Taken. Yeah, this is really good. Uh, I don't think it got in for score. I'm gonna say that's it. You're gonna say eight is your number. I'm gonna say eight. Will you be two? Short. Too short. Did it get in for supporting actor? Supporting actor Jason Miller. I should have said that. And of course, the one that Jay always cinematography? forgets. Cinematography. I'm actually kind of surprised this got in for cinematography, although I shouldn't be. You always forget it. They went to Africa. Yeah. He did go to Africa. Did it, you know that they built an addition to that house so that it would be close to the stairs? Yeah. That rocks. It uh, those stairs are scary. It won the sound award, 
Jay. Jerry Steers. Mm-hmm. And it won an adapted screenplay. Those were its and That was it. Although that was it. I, I I feel like people thought it was gonna get more. What well, do you guys think of the sting, the movie that beat it. This is interesting. I can't wait for Jay's opinions on it. I, I haven't seen the sting. You haven't seen the sting? No, I know. I need to see it. I don't think that's that weird of a thing to say. No, it's it is because like uh, if you're big on the era and you're big on Redford and Newman, who are two giant superstars, you you usually tend to. I need to see it. I mean, I yeah, need to see it. I, took, I, you know, I saw it, it took, about a year ago, and I thought it was fine. Like I, good movie. I, like um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was way more the Redford it, Newman thing that correct. I grew up with, like in my household. And so, yeah. like, I was always really curious about this one. And it's it's like an okay, it, it's a movie, but it is it is weird that like. <laughs> you know, this would kind of just be like a minor Steven Soderbergh movie on Netflix yeah. or something like that. And like that it won best picture over like The Exorcist and American Graffiti and Cries and Whispers. And I don't even know what a touch of glasses, but, you know, beating those other three movies is a little like it crazy because it is kind of you watch it. and You're like, that's fun. Well, I, I know why I won. For everything it's- you just said. Yeah, because it won because Butch Cassidy didn't win Best Picture, and this is the reuniting of not just Newman and Redford, but also George Roy Hill, who directed Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So this was essentially the way to reward all those people, even though um, Newman wasn't nominated, and this is Redford's only acting nomination of his entire career for Best Actor, and he lost to Jack Lemmon. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of like the whole thing is it's like, it's a good solid film, made a ton of money. It's got the, you know, it's, it, they brought the band back together and it worked. I mean, it was another movie that was like the movie made, it was made on five and a half million and it made $257 million. So it was a big hit as well. Um, and, um, and it wasn't as controversial no. as, uh, as, the Exorcist, though, uh, they so the Sting won. The Exorcist was nominated. Uh, a Touch of Class, um, the um, the Melvin Frank film, Cries and Whispers from Bergman, and American Graffiti were the other films nominated for Best Picture. So, um, American Graffiti not bad. Cries and Whispers, very good movie. I would give The Exorcist Best Picture in a heartbeat, though, over the Sting. Um, yeah, is it your favorite movie of the year in general? Of, ooh, ooh of nine of nineteen seventy three. Nineteen seventy three. Um, I mean, I have to look this up real quick. What's yours, Jay? It's the long goodbye. Oh, it's the oh, long goodbye. It's the long goodbye. Oh, that did come this, out this year. This yeah. might be my number one of the year, but a very, very, very close number two would be Badlands. I would put. The Long Goodbye, Badlands, and Don't Look Now ahead of The Exorcist. Yeah. This is a good year because you I'd also, also put Mean Streets, Omicord, F is for Fake, Serpico. Yeah. The Last Detail. Yeah. I put all, yeah. Man, those are really good movies. All of them, what we just said. Yeah. That I don't think. Drifter. It, Let's go. Yeah, I'd probably put Don't Look Now or The Long Goodbye. That would be my best. But the, the, the Exorcist would be in the top five somewhere. Man, Maybe I love Badlands. Five. Badlands is great, though, too. Have you guys done Malik on this series? We might. We're doing him maybe later. Wow. Yeah, maybe later. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're being coy to our listeners. Who knows? I don't want to jump ahead. I forgot that we were on an episode when I started <laughs> answering that question. Maybe we are later this year, folks. Great. Jay just spoiled that. Um, I could edit it out, but why? Why would I do that? Let's, That's give the more list. work for you, you man. Could, you could just Bro. generally say, like, Mal- Malik is coming. Yeah, you'll like, never you know. know. Malik, Malik could be coming, you know next malik could be coming like three years from now like, you know what that's, that's fair it could be decide. like malik and it could take like nine years to get to that series let's put it this way he's my favorite director ever and i generally like covering directors i like wow. i mean so let's we covered my favorite last year 
Might as well cover his. Um, Jay, quick question, real quick. Yes, sir. What would you? What are your uh, thoughts on the last tango in Paris? I haven't seen it. Okay, Jesse, last tango in Paris. You know, I've never seen it either. Okay, homework for both of you, I guess. Yeah. To watch just one of always, the most always one of those where it's like I'll I'll get to it eventually. Yeah. To watch it's one of the just, most controversial that, that's, that's films on of all tier time. Two of the catch up list. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's uh I mean what, Pauline Kale did compare it to the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. Uh it's definitely a movie that you can talk about. Uh that's for sure. Um Well that's good. It's uh it's a little controversial bad boy uh, out there I'm not a big fan of it but it, it i'm not a fan of it overall but i i think it does lead to an interesting discussion maybe one day we'll have that discussion but um would you guys give exorcist best picture based off these nominees oh yeah 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 i mean now that For- we went through some of the other movies that came out that year it's a little wild that like some of that other stuff wasn't nominated. i mean Cry- cries and whispers is, is also very good bergman film too right that's a, that's a like that. top five bergman five, easily yeah easily so I was, um, and I, was, I mean i think american graffiti is great um, yeah but it is wild when you look at it and you're like oh yeah long goodbye was this year and don't look now and you know mean streets and badlands and it is kind of like wild when you see the other stuff that's like not on here yeah i mean i watched serpico last year and i was like god damn it this movie's good and yeah, the last detail is like my second favorite Ashby. Ashby. It might be my favorite. Yeah, it's like right up there. I love Ashby. Jay, we should do Ashby one day. That'd be really That'd good. That'd be fun. That'd be a fun series. Um, a yeah. lot of directors. A lot of directors. A lot of movies that we like. Mm-hmm. Jesse. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Th- thank you guys for having me. No, it's, well, thank you for coming. A, it's great to be a guest. It's great to talk about Billy Friedkin. Pay my respects. You got to pay your respects to the Friedkin. Yeah. Yeah. R.I.P. To, to a legend. Legend. Uh, Jesse, can you tell everybody where we can find you and all your work on the internet? Yeah, I'm in kind of a weird uh, in-between phase at the moment, but uh, mm. I co-host a show called Real Time Review. Uh, that you can watch you can find it on youtube or you can subscribe to the streaming app 11 alive plus and you can watch it there it is a free app you will not need to pay a subscription for it so you know we love that you don't all all you cord cutters worrying that you're going to be paying the same cable bill guess what not you for can this add, one not for this one uh <laughs> yeah so we'll we'll hopefully be uh firing up some new reviews soon it's just like january is just like a I missed the Mean Girls screening, and it was like, "Well, that's that's it." Somebody didn't see the Beekeeper. Mm. I, I also didn't see the Beekeeper. Buzz, were the buzz, bees, baby. Were the bees kept? Were they were they kept at bay? I mean, if you like bee puns, that's the movie for you. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, that's that's shuffling to the top of the airplane movie <laughs> list. <laughs> it's uh, it's bad. David Ayer is really. It's really really sad to see where he's. Oh, uh, uh, you he's had going. me and you lost me. Yeah. Mm boy anyway thank you jesse for coming on yeah thank Daily, you so much jesse. please go we'll have please you on again. go follow him. yeah we'll have you on for for uh something else down the road very very soon jay we're gonna find you buddy evil movies yeah <laughs> we're gonna be paul ws no we're getting through all no. the paul andersons no we're not we're not I doing know. that I'm, tr- I'm, I'm trying to think of like which which one if i had my pick at the anderson cr- probably probably phantom thread is the one that i would have I done. feel like I feel like I would be the like most. There, that's all. That's a big food movie. I feel like there's. I I could go on like a whole. It is a it is a big like food movie. Breakfast Un- order and like preparing omelets and stuff like that. Unfortunately, you would have been going against a person who has memorized the food order, has seen that movie. What, Ryan? You think thirty times? More? I'm gonna I'm gonna guesstimate. Sophia has seen Phantom Thread like. 30 to 50 times like it's it's, it's probably an unhealthy amount it's her it's, favorite movie of all time crazy her well, like she, that's a that's a goal yeah she, no it is a it's goal. her favorite movie of all time yeah uh, so, sounds like someone with good taste yeah yeah yeah, yeah. sophia a regular around these parts yeah it's not like she's uh, an editor or anything here uh yeah. at this website um anyway shout out uh sophia. it's my turn well yeah i was just giving a uh, sophia a shout out since you were doing it as well cool. um but uh yeah you can go 
Uh, this is your show. Why don't you tell everybody? Uh, Letterbox J Ledbetter. Find me there. Always lead with Letterboxd. Yes, sir. Twitter at Mr. J Ledbetter. Uh, any work I'm doing, writing, podcasting, awards watch, awardswatch.com. And for my movie recommendation of the week, Ryan, I'm really leaning into 80s, 90s action trash. I've heard you. I've heard this from you, and yeah. I'm curious and what the trash is from the from the heap that you're pulling out. I watched Tango and Cash. Okay, I've never seen Network watch Tango and Cash. Yeah, this is the this is the the person I deal with, folks. <laughs> Tango, Tango and Cash of, isn't that bad, though. No, no, but I to, had a great but to time prioritize with it. Tango and Cash over Network, like, I had what a are great we doing? time with it. Yeah. And the question is, is Tango and Cash a good movie? No. I'm not sure if it is a good movie, but it is a great movie. <laughs> and I get what you're, you're saying. You're going to have a ball with Tango and Cash. Sylvester Stallone pay, plays like a smart guy with glasses, which is very funny. Which one is Tango and which one is Cash? Uh, so Stallone is Tango and Kurt is Cash. Is that literally and, their names? Yeah. Okay. Then their that's, last names. God, I fucking love movies. Oh. Yeah. And uh, Kurt Russell absolutely steals the show. He's amazing. When does he not steal the show? I mean, it's it's a good question. Jack Thank Palance you. is on Palance is in it. Hundred as the main bad guy. Yeah. I haven't seen Tango and like ridiculous gadgets that actually aren't that cool, but they try to play off as super cool. Um, Some genuinely pretty decent action. Also, it's directed by Mm. one of, or it was, it's credited as being directed by one of Andre Tarkovsky's (laughs) best, uh, most frequent collaborators. Mm. I want to. I want to imagine Andre Tarkovsky just sitting there and like watching Tango and Cash. <laughs> put on, like put on stroking, Tango and Cash. Stroking his mustache, yeah. and just being like, hmm. it's directed mm. by the guy who co-wrote Andre Rublev. You got to be fucking kidding! No, me. I'm not kidding. I, I, my understanding is that he basically got fired shortly after production started, but he is the credited director of that movie. Who did they? Who did Ghost directed it? Then Kurt Russell. I think a lot of Stallone. A lot of Stallone, okay, because like you know, that's the big thing with Tombstone. Yeah, it was Kurt yeah. did it? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever see Tuso? I haven't seen it. You really should watch it. That's a J movie in the making. God, this is really it, this. So often, it sounds like I've never watched any movie except the one that we're talking. It took about you until podcast. like a year and a half ago to finally watch Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That is true. Just think of all the great experiences you have ahead of you. That's what I tell yeah. people. But the thing, like, but the thing, catch with the, the, catch the thing with I do, the thing I do is I've watched, I've seen thirty six Robert Altman movies, but very rarely does it come up on a podcast. What do you think of Quintet? <laughs> right. But then, but then they bring up you know some movie, some very popular movie that I haven't seen. And it's like, I mean, like uh, one of no, the hun- but have you seen the Ballad of Cable Hogue? Yeah, from Sam Peckinpah. Yeah, that's and it's like nobody cares. But yeah, I've but, seen it. But I mean, if you went down a lament rabbit hole, you could finally watch fucking Network. I should. I mean, I need to. I'm doing. I'm doing all of these things. You know what I'm doing uh, on the side? Planning on doing a little. Oh, oh boy. Closing all. Closing the loop on uh, Francis Coppola. Oh, uh, yeah? I need to. I need to do that before, before Megalopolis. Yeah, mm. I haven't seen like the weird, like super early stuff or the like weird the the, crap. Like, yeah, yeah. The, the like experimental late, garbage. Yeah, twenty yeah. first century stuff. What right. do we think that movie's going to be? It's either going to be one of the greatest things we've ever seen, or it's going to be an epic disaster. That we'll there's no middle ground. Like, no, but what no, if it's what no if it's just um, what was the Don Quixote movie? The Terry, oh, true. Terry yeah. Gillian movie, the man who yeah, killed what Don Quixote. Like, what if it's just that, where it's like that was okay? Yeah, I guess that's true. And we spent that t- also Adam Driver in that too. By yeah, the way. yeah. Um, Adam Driver will get your dream project made. Yeah, he's fucking like in Ferrari. All- yeah, Ferrari. What was the Don Quixote movie made? It wasn't the Ballad of Don Quixote. No, it was like the the, the the man, man who, who became Don Quixote, man, something like that. Something. Jay, the the name of that uh, film is the man who killed the Don man Quixote. who killed Don Quixote. Of course, we reviewed that film on uh, In session a podcast. Film. Yeah, our prior pod. Yes, um, it was. I remember saying it was pretty decent. 
who who played Don Quixote? If was it Jonathan Price? Jonathan Price. That's right. What a fucking movie that was. Anyway, um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox at Ramacquade77. You can find all my work here at awardswatch.com. If you like podcasts, listen to the main show. Uh, We have an episode every Monday. This one, of course, comes out every Thursday. Uh, Five star reviews on let on uh, well, not Letterbox though. You could give it if I mean they're doing TV shows now. They'll probably do podcasts down the road. Uh, Five stars on iTunes and on Spotify reviews. We greatly appreciate it. Good reviews, please. Uh, newsletter go and get the newsletter and sign up for it on awardswatch.com comes out two times a week it's a great way to get all of our reviews interviews and podcasts all in one place uh, recommendation from me Jay oh man um, well I mean I mean, watch ne- I mean watch network there you go that's um, fine you know watch network that's an incredible movie about a that is as relevant as it was then as it is now. It's Sydney Sydney Lamette's masterpiece. Um, might be my favorite. Is it Sydney Lamette's masterpiece. Have you? I, I'm sorry. Have you seen it? No. Oh, just can you Twelve Angry Men? Can you comment on it? No. I mean, I just love Twelve Angry Men. Yeah, uh, I think Sydney Lamette has maybe like three or four masterpieces. Yeah. Um, well, that's the question. Somebody had multiple masterpieces, right? Yeah, I mean, he but does. But if you say it is Cindy, Cindy, Sydney Lumet's masterpiece, does that mean it is his best movie? If you say his masterpiece, I think so. I think that that's not a controversial. No, statement no, I don't. To I make. don't think it is either. I need to. I need to watch. You know what, Ryan? I'm going to watch it this week. You really? About that? You going to put it, it on? Week. Yep. You promise? I promise. By the the next podcast, I will have watched Network. Yeah, 12 Angry Men is my fourth favorite Sydney Lament movie. Let's run them down. What's your one, two, three? One, two, three. Uh, well, Network's my one. Mm-hmm. The Verdict. You ever seen it? Uh, been a long, long time since. Love The Verdict. Verdict. And uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Oh, that actually might be his best movie. Yeah. It's interchangeable with those three. Dog and then Day. Tw- 12 Dog Angry Day Men's great. <laughs> Dog Day rules. That's actually, that's going to be hard to pass, actually. I think I yeah I Got think you dog day I don't know I think you like uh I think you like network oh I'm gonna watch network next pod I'll give a full review I'm I'm bonus well, episode network bonus episode okay now you're just stretching stretching the imagination um next week's show we will be back we will be talking about sorcerer sorcerer looking forward to uh, talking about that rickety bridge with uh, dynamite. Fun guest. So, fun guest. Looking forward to that. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. And we'll see you all next time.